Hi everyone, um, I'm Millie uh, from Privacy International, I'm one of the solicitors there. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk a bit about our Neighbourhood Watch campaign uh, and to go into some of the technologies uh, which we have information on as part of that ca campaign. Um, and some of these technologies a lot of you will know about, hopefully I'll say things that some of the things that you don't know about, um, but please ask questions, but I think we're going to keep them till the end. Um, but that will probably be a really interesting part as well when you start asking more detail about the things I'm going to speak about. Um, the aim of our Neighbourhood Watched campaign is to raise awareness about technologies that are being used by law enforcement in the UK. Um, but we hope that uh, people outside the UK could use these materials too. There are issues with adapting some of the graphics. They're very British, some of the police officers. Um, but the information should hopefully be fairly standard or adapted um, if you do work with other organisations outside the UK. Um, one of the key focuses between now and May is that the Police and Crime Commissioner elections are, I think, in May 2020. So one of the focuses we've had, especially um, speaking with ORG and their local groups, is putting pressure on these police and crime commissioners um, as a particular pressure point in relation to getting more transparency about the technologies being used by various police forces. Um, there are 40 police forces across England and Wales and each one has a police and crime commissioner. And their job is to be the voice of the local community and hold the police to account. They do that to varying degrees. Um, but hopefully the tools we have, if you want to take that forward, would allow you to do that either as an individual uh, or with a group of people. Um, and certainly some of the org local groups are looking at doing this too. Um, so whether you're based in London or maybe you have contacts in other regions in the UK, that would be really cool. Um, I'm going to go through a number of the technologies um, on which we have explainers uh, that you can, sh like, for example, share on social media, share with your friends and family, um, share with people who might not know about this in so much detail. Um, and for some of them, I've given a few resources if you want to go much deeper on the issue, which perhaps some of you will, and you may already know the sort of more, more surface level detail about them. Um, and um, I, I thought it was worth emphasising in a way why it's import important to question why any of this matters in terms of the police using this. Um, and we all may have different reasons why we're concerned about it. Um, for facial recognition, social media monitoring, remote hacking, um, we'll all have different implications for different groups and reactions from different communities, whether they're people who are over-policed uh, or they're individuals who simply want to know what their local police force are doing um, and want more transparency. I think it's, it's, it's pretty clear that the police are using an ever-expanding array of surveillance tools and these give them the capacity, um, if they're using them, to spy on us as we go about our everyday lives. Uh, I'm sure you'll all be very aware of the, uh, the Met rolling out facial recognition, and this is despite intense opposition from groups like Liberty and Big Brother Watch, and they're litigating on this. But it's not just them, it's also regulators, like the Information Commissioner, who stated there need to be improvements in how police authorise and deploy facial recognition technology. And they've also called for the government to induce a statutory and binding code of practice. Um, but unfortunately, there's been a lot of government inaction over most of these technologies, pretty much. Um, so even if the pressure is put on the police by communities, and the police say, well, there's only so much we can do, and then the Home Office aren't dealing with it, the government aren't taking a lead on it, um, in, in a way, it demands more action from communities to say, well, someone needs to step up uh, and, and address how this can be lawful. Um, and also, we've seen uh, just another example, the treatment of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, they've been treated as a potential threat to national security, I think, over a year ago. That was covered by The Guardian on the 6th of February uh, this month. Uh, and also, we're all aware of that they were labelled as an extremist um, organisation. Um, and... Uh, a separate example, the Surveillance Camera Commissioner, so a sort of regulator, warned in his annual report about increased expansion of highly sophisticated video platforms. Uh, so this is uh, the analytics capability. So it's not just facial recognition, it's gait, emotion and voice recognition. And the Surveillance Camera Commissioner looks at uh, both private and public actors. So that's, um, if you recall the, the news about King's Cross, it would relate to 
cameras used by organisations uh, in the private sector too. Um, so th sort of the overall um, emphasis of this work is that we want communities to question their local police forces, but not just that, to put pressure on the police and crime commissioners and your MPs if you choose uh, that route too. Um, but when, we, when we, were, we, we launched this campaign, they were wholly focused on Brexit, and now they're uh, maybe more focused on other issues. Um, but um, hopefully some of the, um, the committees that would scrutinise this might be more open to, to looking at it. And, and some of them have looked at this to varying degrees. Um, and uh, we think this is important for local communities because it just increases and completely changes the dynamics of how you can be monitored to state the obvious, whether it's attending public meetings, peaceful protests, as we've seen from Extinction Rebellion, um, who knows what monitoring that allows if you're given a certain label, um, engaging in controversial but lawful dialogue, and in terms of questioning the PCC, um, some of the responses we've had from them, well, people have had from them is, well, why don't you just ask the police and use a freedom of information request? Well, anyone who's tried using a freedom of information request knows that's a fairly blunt tool. It's very useful. Uh, you often don't necessarily get the information you want, uh, or you end up having to go through a lengthy process of challenging the police to get it. Um, and we feel that the police and crime commissioners can't just fob you off and say, well, why don't you put in a FOIA request? They should actually... Uh, be able to know what the local police force are doing and, and there are ways of engaging them and putting pressure on them, particularly with this May 2020 date coming up and, use, for example, using local media because then, then not a lot of people know about police and crime commissioners. Not a lot of people are going to be involved in voting. So it seems like quite a useful pressure point, at least from our point of view. Um, <clears throat> so, so the point of the campaign is, is very basic tools to help people do this kind of campaigning work uh, and you may have better or different ideas about how you want to do it or to do something completely different with the information we've produced. Um, and I just thought before I go through the different technologies, um, one of the questions we get asked and or gets asked and I think has a whole page on it um, is, is if you have nothing to hide, why should I care about these new technologies that law enforcement are using? Uh, surely they just get the criminals and, and that's like something that will come up when you chat with your family or friends as much as if you're speaking uh, at events. Um, and I think it's also, at times it can be annoying, but it's also a very relevant question in some ways when we think how people who don't necessarily know a lot about these uh, technologies might question whether it matters and how we can work out to engage with a broader community of individuals. Um, there are so many responses to this question. Uh, you can just Google it. But I think one of the issues is that using the terminology something to hide implies that you've done something wrong that you don't want to disclose. And that, to me, seems like the wrong way of looking at it. Um, because we, as communities and individuals in society, must question what we are sacrificing if we can no longer go about our everyday business or go to the shops or meet with friends be politically active, practice our religion, uh, without being subject to constant surveillance and analysis, either of our clothes, our social media, our expressions, our behaviour. Um, and having nothing to hide doesn't have anything really to do with fear. It's about the fear of loss of privacy itself, which is to me the more worrying thing than actually what might be found out as a result of different technologies even though I've used uh, mobile phone extraction tools on my own phones and it is kind of terrifying uh, what can be found out, um, even though it seems fairly innocuous. Um, and, you know, it does, it, it can have an impact on our behaviour, our relationships and ultimately our autonomy once we understand what these technologies can do. And once we explain it to other people as well, you know, that's the key. You may all be very knowledgeable about these different technologies, but we need to keep speaking to people and explaining it in ways that it will relate to them um, as well. So, um, <coughs> this is, I've already spoken about this briefly. Um, so on our website, if you search Privacy International and Neighbourhood Watched, uh, the, the page will come up with lots of different uh, resources. We have a campaign pack, which is the, the thing I put the arrow on there. 
And I'm just going to show you that briefly, um, just the contents page. Uh, just so you know, <coughs> if you wanted to use that and you wanted to go a bit more down the campaign route, what you could have a look at using or adapting yourself. So it's got a brief uh, explainer on these different issues. And then uh, something about how you can inform, empower and mobilise. Um, and gives you a lot more information about police and crime commissioners as well. Um, and then gives you sort of ideas for holding a community meeting. But there's also, I'm going to show some of these, the explainer graphics, which again, depending on how you want to use these materials, you might just want to download those and share them in different groups so that you can give people the basic information about this technology. And so these are all under educational exp and explanatory. Um, <coughs> so um, now I'm going to... Uh, go through some of the technologies. Um, please, if you do have questions, uh, like make a note of them and ask me at the end, because I'm not going to go into too much detail um, on all of them. And so, this is this is um, within the uh, campaign path. But we, the way we kind of see it is not to isolate any of the technologies because they can be used together. So that's our web of police surveillance. So facial recognition possibly one most of you have heard of or will be familiar with. Um, and very briefly, um, in essence, it captures live images of anyone walking past it and makes a unique biometric of your face, which is more like a fingerprint, really, than a picture. Um, several police forces are using this. Uh, they can track and analyse people in public spaces in real time and check Im um, images against a watch list, which they put together. So... Uh, that's one of the aspects that, that people are also asking about it, is who, who is on these watch lists, how are they formulated. When we're told about these technologies, it says it's suspects, but when you dig into it, it's not always that clear um, who will fall on them as well. Um, there's a lot um, of research that's been done about the bias of this technology, um, and there's ongoing litigation as well by both Liberty... Um, and Big Brother Watch and Concern from the Information Commissioner. Um, so this, just to show you, I'm not going to read it all. These are the explainers we have on the website. I think there is a, as a PDF or something, a different type. But you can download them and then share them and use them as you want. And it gives you just the real bare basics of facial recognition if you want it in a way to explain to people or to read about it yourself. Um, if you want to go into more detail... Um, because I'm not going to do that now. Um, there's a, uh, an inquiry that's going on in Scotland, and pretty much every organisation, I think Org has probably made a submission, we've made a submission, there are tonnes of submissions, and so if you really want to go into the details of facial recognition, I'd say that's probably got the most up-to-date resources. Um, if you I think it was to the biometrics inquiry, yeah. um, but um, certainly you'll be able to find it in there. Just, there's so much information in there. Um, that's probably better for you to read and digest if you want to see the different arguments that are being put forward, um, both for and against it. I think it's probably both sides are in, in there too. Um, and the different, you'll hear different polls and studies as well that are quoted by different sides of the argument, and they're both in there too, well, a number of them. Um, and then there's also the different reports on the Met live trials, and um, the Ada Lovelace report is quoted quite a lot as well when you start reading about facial recognition. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about mobile phone extraction, which uh, is my favourite topic because it's the one I know most about, so ask me questions on that one. <laughs> um, so this is an area we at Privacy International have done a lot of work on. Um, we, just to summarise, we've done a complaint to the Information Commissioner. I'm hoping that report will come out soon. It very much focuses on data protection, which is just one part of the problem. Um, but it should be quite interesting to finally get uh, someone to look at this problem rather than it just being NGOs saying, can someone please look at whether this is lawful, how this is lawful. Um, so the way it works is the police plug your phone into something either the size of an iPad or directly into the, the computer as, as well. Um, and they can download everything on your phone. Because it says photo and I was a little confused. Yeah. It's, um, oh, whoops, everything from your phone. Sorry, typo. Um, it's not as simple as that. We have a very long technical analysis. 
It depends on your phone. It depends on the operating system. It depends on all sorts of things, how much data they can get. But essentially, for most people who this hap would happen to, they can get a vast amount of information, um, and with varying de degrees of speed as well. Um, and <clears throat> one of the interesting things to think about, I guess, now is is the years that this will go back about not just you as the owner, but your friends, family, colleagues. And particularly if we start talking about younger people, um, the, the history that exists on the phone of someone who is now, I guess, in their teens or 20s is very different to the history that law enforcement could get of someone who's now in their 40s or 50s. Um, and so it, it completely changes um, what the police are able to access, and yet they're still relying on very old legislation to do this. Um, and, and the, I mean, one of the simple things is that police need a warrant, in most cases, to search your home, but not your phone. And there's way more on your phone than you could find on a person in your home. And still, in Scotland, in the debates we were having up there, and all were involved in that too, they kept comparing it to a briefcase. Like, there's no way your phone equates to what you could store in a briefcase. It's, and we kept complaining about it, and they just wouldn't change that example. Um, so, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's... And this is... Um, I've got lots of slides on what was extracted from my phone, if anyone wants uh, a talk at another time. But this is just a brief one from an Android phone. Um, and this is the summary. So this was using a Celebrite UFED Touch 2. Uh, which is probably quite an old model now. Um, so you can see um, calendars, call logs, cell towers. This, I only used this phone for about a year, I think. And then I chucked it in my drawer and then terrified myself when I did this. <laughs> I realised I really need to wipe my phones. Um, but it's, yeah, all the Facebook signal and the red numbers are deleted. So don't think just because you delete it, it's gone from your phone. It's still there. Um, Device locations, so that's pulled from all sorts of different things on your phone. Uh, emails, applications, messages, passwords, powering events. Um, web history is, is pretty huge. Um, wireless networks, I think it's Bluetooth networks should be up there somewhere. Um, and, on, and when you look at something, for example, your browsing history, it's not just what you browse, it's each time you typed it in. So when I made spelling mistakes and you go and look at that, it shows you all the different ways you've typed it in if you keep misspelling it and correcting it. It shows you, for example, if you buy something online, it'll have pages of stuff, which is all the banking information being processed through the browser. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's crazy the amount of information that they can get from a phone. Um, and the fact that they're only just talking about this publicly now is, is really shocking to me. And when I first heard about this in, um, at the end of 2017, I thought I was, I was really naive uh, or that the law must be fine because how could I have only just heard about this when in my old job I used to do actions against the police, not criminal law because I, maybe I would have heard of it, but um, like how was no one talking about this and, and, and it's, you know, it's in a way thanks to our freedom of information request but also thanks to a lot of the work done by Big Brother Watch and Centre for Women's Justice, who have talked about it in the context of um, rape survivors of us as well, that this is finally getting the attention it needs. Um, so yeah, and anyway, this is just the explainer we have on it, very brief um, information. And it, interesting, on the doing um, what are my rights bit is quite hard because we don't really know what your rights are <laughs> in a lot of these technologies. Um, so often those sections and what does the law said are the hardest because all the police cite different law as well. Um, so just because we've done quite a lot on mobile phone extraction, I thought I'd show you uh, an extract from the page with more resources you might want to look at. Um, the technical look if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and then also a sort of more in detail about the types of data that they can extract. And then um, just because some of the debates have been around can you limit what's extracted. Um, I just wrote something on that, um, looking at some of the things that Celebrite had said, which didn't quite match what was said in the media um, as well. Um, cloud extraction is not in our Neighbourhood Watch campaign, but I'm just going to briefly mention it, um, because we've got a lot on our website on that too. We just released some research. 
And this is kind of stage two of mobile phone extraction. And it, there are different ways of getting into all your data that's stored in the cloud, but one of them is when the police extract data from your cloud, from your phone, they can extract tokens, which is basically, rather than getting your password, it's a, it's a way of getting into your phone without needing your username and password. Um, and the, the longer, re, longer piece on our website goes into more detail on that. But they, a lot of the forensic experts see this as the next step from mobile phone extraction because there's so much more in the cloud as well. Some of it quite different, um, but in terms of what the police are interested in. And uh, on our website, we go into detail on all the different apps um, and cloud-based um, data that the, these, I think about four or five different companies have said that they can get to, whether it's Uber, whether it's actual live voice recordings from Amazon Echo, uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, um, like booking.com seems to be a very popular one. Um, so this is just another huge amount of um, information that can be taken and an area that we're really not hearing anything either from the police or certainly not government about how this is regulated or how it's lawful because often we hear about the troubles of having to go to, say, Amazon or Facebook to get this information. No one's telling you, well, actually, there's a, an easy workaround that doesn't involve a warrant, that doesn't involve telling the company, um, and results in them getting a huge amount of information. Um, so uh, I'll briefly look at predictive policing. Um, so this is being used by a couple of forces in the UK. I think predominantly Durham have a harm assessment risk tool. Uh, and the West, West Midlands have a national data analytics solution. And I think these are quite different. So this, this isn't an area I've done a huge amount of work, but there are essentially two different ways it's being used. Um, and the first is predictive mapping, so looking at police data about past crimes to identify hotspots um, and areas that are likely to experience more crime, so then it would send police to these the hotspots. Um, someone did a quite, I don't know if it was actually a research piece or an article about how, well, shouldn't that result in lots of police going to Canary Wharf and why aren't they there? Um, but apparently not. Um, and uh, the other is the individual risk assessment um, to predict the likelihood of a person committing certain crimes. Um, one of the key issues um, that's discussed uh, in relation to this is that a lot of it uses historical data. Um, and so it will reflect long-standing biases um, and exacerbate existing inequalities. Um, and there's also a, a lack of transparency in a lot of ways about how these tools work and how easy or difficult it, it would be to understand the predictions that are made depending on uh, the machine learning tools that are used. Uh, I haven't read all of these both of these papers yet, so I, I don't want to say they're great, but they seem to be the most update on use by UK police um, of predictive tools. One's by the Law Society, and the bottom of, of there is their map, uh, which looks at algorithmic decision making. Um, and then there's, I think, Rusi are producing another uh, report this year. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say, having briefly read it, I agree with all of it, but they're certainly the most up to date that I'm aware of that have looked at this issue, at least in terms of understanding what's being used by different police forces in the UK. Um, and again, we have very simple explainers um, on the website as well. Uh, and I think that links to the Durham uh, tool as well. And a lot of uh, police forces used to use, um, well, a couple of them tri trialed PredPol, which you may have heard of, which was used in America. Uh, and one of the things I think I was told about uh, PredPol at least in America, is that the forces in America that signed up to use it had to promote it, even if they thought it was useless. So also then you're looking at different things about well, when people say it's, it's useful or it works, what's really behind that as well. Um, uh, so social media monitoring, um, I'll look at briefly now. So this is, is kind of what it says, is monitoring your social media, in media without you knowing. There are different ways that this can be done and what, uh, sort of simplifying it would be overt and covert. So are they just looking what is like openly there where you don't need to get around privacy settings or you know use various forms of deception to make friends with someone? 
Um, and the other is where you would uh, conduct more uh, intrusive covert surveillance. So you might join certain groups on Facebook um, and you'd be using deception. Uh, and this can be done on a mass scale. There's lots of reports in America about how it's happened against Black Lives Matters. And it, depending on the software that's used, um, I think one of the ones they used in relation to Black Lives Matters was, uh, was about influencers, so who's, who's really influential, who's influencing all the people around it. And then they just changed it to who's a threat, who's a threat actor. So the most influential people on, on Twitter became then the threats. Um, and um, we've, we've, done, um, we've done a bit more work. I mean, it's not quite related to uh, law enforcement, but on, so, on the use by local authorities. And uh, the guidance from the surveillance commissioner is actually, well, if people haven't sorted out their privacy settings, then it's kind of fair enough to go and have a look at their social media. But if you do it more than once, then you probably should think about getting some kind of authorization. Uh, but there seems to be no audits or checks of, of local authorities using it in a, on a one-off. And a one-off could be looking at it for a whole day and taking screenshots and then making a decision on someone's access to benefits based on that. So um, that's an upcoming piece of work that we're hopefully going to produce soon. But uh, I think it then creates a very unfair situation where you have people who understand privacy settings uh, who have a higher protection uh, from the authorities and then people who don't understand them or whose privacy settings have been reset because of uh, some thing that Facebook did who are, who are more vulnerable and are fair game, uh, which certainly doesn't seem right to me. Uh, so this is a bit of a longer explanation as well on that. Um, and, the, um, and it is a topic that the... Um, Surveillance Commissioner has looked at in terms of law enforcement use and was very critical, I think, at least around from 2014 onwards, that this is just because it's in the public doesn't mean it's fair game. You still need to have proper procedures around it. So whether they're still acting um, improperly or not, I'm, I'm not sure because I haven't done any recent uh, FOIAs around it, but it's an area that that may be of interest to you to be asking your local police forces about, particularly in areas of protest surveillance, I would have thought, um, or people they're interested in. Um, so body-worn cameras um, is, is kind of like a, a... It's an area where I think initially people felt that this was a great tool for transparency, but attitudes seem to be changing a bit. And, and one of the... the um, things in the future that could happen is that they become uh, enabled with facial recognition technology. But equally, um, just because facial recognition technology isn't being used live when the cameras uh, are being used by an officer doesn't mean that analytics doesn't happen afterwards. And that's what we don't know is how is this being used afterwards if lots of police officers are using it as they go around a protest or in a particular area. You may think, well, this gives me power because then it shows what they do. But certainly there's been a lot of work in America that's shown that that's actually not necessarily the case. And they have the power to turn it off and on. They have a power to say certain things as they're arresting you. Um, and then the CCTV might show something completely different, which is certainly the case in a lot of videos I've seen in America, um, where I think it, it's, it's proved it's becoming more controversial, uh, whereas people sort of initially thought, um, that it would be quite a, an empowering tool uh, as well. So this is a very brief thing on body-worn cameras. Uh, and then uh, IMSI catchers. Uh, so IMSI catchers is, is like a fake uh, cell tower, uh, which will imitate a mobile phone. Uh, there are lots of different ways IMSI catchers could work. Um, and there's been a lot of good research, I think, uh, in America by EFF. In the UK, we submitted freedom of information requests about IMSI catchers so we could learn a bit more about how police are using them, if they're using them at protests, uh, what capabilities do the IMSI catchers have, are they, are they just, you know, what can they intercept if they're using them. They neither confirmed nor denied. Uh, we challenged them and we lost. So at the moment, we have no idea if they're using them uh, and we have no transparency around them, even though... They're very open about their use, for example, in America and Germany. Um, it's been decided that in the UK, 
um, we're not allowed to know. Um, so yeah, you can, you can find out more about them, but we just don't know if they're being used here. Um, but based on our evidence and our witness evidence we submitted at the tribunal, there was a lot of information that they were being used, but we just, we just can't get any further than that, unfortunately. Um, and very briefly, um, I'm just going to touch on hacking um, as a tool that would be used by police, but perhaps you would hope subjects uh, to a high level of authorization and scrutiny because um, of the nature of it and the processes it would have to go through. Uh, but that doesn't make it any better um, because it's exploiting uh, vulnerabilities in your phone uh, or indeed your, your laptop or other device. Um, and then those flaws aren't being fixed. So once you open it for the police, it's open for anyone else um, and leaves devices insecure. And this is certainly in terms of mobile phones, the things that will be ex used uh, to extract data from your phone, um, whether it's using a tool uh, that's provided by uh, um, one of the extraction technologies providers or whether it's, it's by hackers, because everything that certainly the extraction tools can do, if you had the time and the knowledge and the resources, you could probably do yourself without those uh, tools. They just make it a lot easier and quicker. Um, and again, just a very brief um, explainer on this. Uh, so, um, so yeah, just what, what you can do. You can use the campaign pack and materials. Uh, you can contact your PCC. Um, you can put pressure on them for May 2020. Maybe you can get with, involved with some of the org local groups if they're planning on doing something. Um, and if that's not really what you're up for, you can find other ways to put this on the agenda because we certainly need the support of people who are interested and members of the public to make this a bigger issue. Um, certainly facial recognition's got a lot of um, support and recognition, but these other ones are still being used too. So it needs different groups of people and communities who may see the impact of these technologies in different ways to also speak out and say, well, do you know what, for me and, and people like me, this has a certain impact that you haven't thought about. Um, you can also use your social media. Uh, you can do your own FOIA campaign um, and enjoy the joys of the frustration of that. Um, but at least it would show a level of, of public interest as well in these technologies that the police keep getting asked about them. Um, and there are various things you can ask for which, which are listed in the campaign pack, which we've said you can ask your PCC about, which you could also do a FOIA about, like, can I have your data protection impact assessment for social media monitoring? And they won't have done one. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, I'm now open to questions. <laughs>